I'm going to be introducing the next speaker, and it's my distinct pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Jeanette Lin. Uh, unlike me, who kind of slowly migrated south from Vermont and Chicago, Dr. Lin migrated from all the way from San Diego and uh, gradually and uh, Irvine uh, up north. She did her undergrad at Pomona College, uh, MD at the University of California in San Diego, and uh, followed by residency as well, and a fellowship in, uh, in cardiology at um, UC Irvine, and uh, ACHD here at UCLA, and she's been a faculty since 2012. She's been a great mentor, colleague, and friend. Thank you, Dr. Lin, please. Thank you, Dr. Larry. For the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna be covering what echocardiographic um, imaging and exercise testing tells us about patients with Fontan palliation. I have no disclosures. So we know we all do echoes on a regular basis for our patients, that much is obvious. So what are we hoping to learn from these studies? Um, and while transthoracic echocardiogram is the majority of the imaging that we're going to be doing for our patients, what do we add by doing transesophageal echocardiogram? Is there a right time and place for doing routine transesophageal echocardiograms in our patients with congenital heart disease and Fontan specifically? Then I'll talk briefly about cardiopulmonary exercise testing, what its strengths are, what its limitations are in terms of telling us um, and teaching us about our patients, and some potential future directions as well. So lots of people here do echoes, read echoes, um, read echo reports. So we know that echocardiograms can tell us about ventricular function, um, obstruction within the ventricles, valve stenosis, valve regurgitation. It can tell us about baffle leaks or fenestrations, whether or not there's a thrombus anywhere in the heart. We can do bubble studies as well. And the bubble studies will tell us about the presence of right to left intracardiac or intrapulmonary, or sometimes even extracardiac shunting. And that can come from baffle leaks, venovenous collaterals, pulmonary arterial venous malformations. TEE can be very helpful for procedural guidance, and many of our operators are also very familiar with intracardiac echocardiograms as well. And that can be useful for transpaffle punctures, for EP procedures, um, and it's also very useful for procedural surgical planning to better delineate anatomy as well. So let's walk through one such patient and some of his images. So this is a 26-year-old patient of ours at UCLA who has a diagnosis of, of hypoplastic left heart syndrome who has a lateral tunnel fontan. So this is his systemic right ventricle. And when we look at these echocardiograms, we don't just say, well, how does this systemic right ventricle look compared with a patient with a normal heart? We kind of put it in the context of what you expect to see for someone who's living with a systemic right ventricle. So overall, the function is mild to moderately decreased, but not out of what the range of normal for a patient with this type of anatomy. So you'll see on the right image that this patient has had a prior um, occlusion of a fenestration and also a baffle leak. So he's two devices there in the lateral tunnel fontan, of which you can see one of the devices there. And you can see a little bit of flow through that device, probably not much. But more distracting on this image is obviously the torrential tricuspid valve regurgitation. And we'll take a closer look at that. So looking at this image here, you see the patient has a septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. If we explain through that on this TE, Here's the anterior leaflet, and then here's this posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve, which is severely prolapsed. We'll see that this patient has dual regurgitant jets, one here between the septal and the anterior leaflets, and also um, another jet here on the x plane between the anterior and um, posterior leaflets as well. So this is not uncommon for our Fontan patients who have significant AV valve regurgitation. And we know that having severe AV valve regurgitation is very detrimental for hemodynamics in the Fontan patient. So we're looking at this, and we're concerned about it. But while we're looking at it, we also want to try to understand a little bit better. And I'll show you some measurements we did at the end for consideration of future potential interventions. 3D echocardiogram um, can be helpful in confirming um, what you've already seen on the 2D. And here you see in this 3D, if we're looking down at the tricuspid valve from the right atrium, you have the anterior leaflet here, which does prolapse this septal leaflet, which also prolapses. But here's your posterior leaflet here that prolapses much more than, an than the anterior and the septal leaflet. So 3D can be helpful as well. 
This is a TEE that was done in the catheterization lab at the same time as, as um, the cardiac catheterization that we do routinely for our Fontan patients. And if we can click on that image on the right, we'll play this clip that shows a bubble study with an injection from the SVC. And you can see that the bubble study is positive. Um, there are bubbles here coming into the right atrium and to the right ventricle. And so you know that there is a right to left shunt of some sort, but it doesn't necessarily tell you which level the shunt is coming from. This could be from a venous, venous collateral, but it could also be from an aorta, um, a pulmonary AVM as well. So that's why we then follow that up with selective agitated saline contrast injections into the LPA and RPA so we can get a sense of whether or not there's pulmonary AVMs on that particular side of the lung. And if so, how prominent those AVMs are. So you see with the RPA bubble study that there's some sludge up here at the beginning of the clip, but you also see discrete bubbles that come um, into the ventricle. So this would be a mildly positive, probably one plus positive bubble study in the RPA. And then if we play the right clip, you'll see the selective bubble study into the LPA. Um, you'll see some sludging here. Um, but there's not much in the way of discrete bubbles that cross over into the right atrium and right ventricle. So overall, um, a much more reassuring LPA bubble study. And this is not uncommonly seen where you see more pulmonary AVMs on one side than the other side, and it has to do with how hepatic blood flow and hepatic factor are oftentimes preferentially directed to one lung as compared with the other that may be more supp so supplied by the Glen shunt. So, the other thing that I mentioned is that as we look at this patient and we look at this TEE where there's severe tricuspid regurgitation, we're also thinking ahead to what options we may be able to offer this patient in the future for the tricuspid regurgitation. And we'll talk about MitraClip um, in a couple of sessions here, but MitraClip is a transcatheter um, repair of the mitral valve that has been used in the tricuspid valve as well, but has not really been used in the Fontan population. But as we're thinking ahead and trying to push technology forward and using them in our patient population, it's a question that we want to ask ourselves. And as we're looking at these TEs, we want to try to get a sense of whether we think that this patient's anatomy would be suitable for use of mitral clip. And as those of you who do mitral clips know, there's some standard measurements we take about the height from the valve annulus um, and potentially where we might puncture through that baffle. So cardiopulmonary exercise testing is the second half of my talk here. And so those of us who practice in congenital heart disease routinely do cardiopulmonary exercise testing for our congenital heart patients. And we'll go over what information it gives us and what its limitations may be. But again, those of you who either supervise these tests or refer your patients for these tests know that patients hate cardiopulmonary exercise tests. They hate them with a passion. And when you tell them you're going to send them for a cardiopulmonary exercise test, you get the eye roll sometimes once, sometimes twice, sometimes a full 720 degree eye roll because they roll their eyes like two or three times and then they try to beg out of it and they say that their ankle is sore. They hate it. But what are our options then for trying to understand what we can do to figure out exercise capacity in our patients? Well, there's one option that we can do and if we could play this um, clip, this is something you could do if you wanted to in the clinic to assess your patient's exercise capacity. Can you all sound on that? I don't think that's what Dr. Abelson sounds like. So this is Josue Medina, he's a patient of ours who has a lateral tunnel function. He has a lateral tunnel Fontan, and he aspires to be a professional boxer. So this is Dr. Abelhosen sacrificing himself and his spleen to assess his patient's exercise capacity in the clinic. You can certainly do it this way, but it's not highly recommended. Um, Dr. Abelhosen did survive this clinic visit. Credit to Dr. Danny Sanchez for the video. Um, what you're missing without the audio is the force of those punches. This is a pretty strong boxer. So we think that this is a much more civilized way um, and a safer way for us to assess our patient's exercise capacity. Um, and this is a, one of my co-fellows from fellowship doing an exercise, cardiopulmonary exercise test. 
So what do we learn from cardiopulmonary exercise testing? We get all these numbers, right? And the most important number that we always look at is the peak VO2. And this is the single best indicator for cardiopulmonary function. It tells us what the maximal oxygen consumption is for a patient on that particular um, exercise modality. And it's a product of the patient's cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate, as well as cellular oxygen extraction. Looking at the heart rate response to exercise is very important as well. Oxygen pulse is basically the VO2 divided by the heart rate. So for patients who have impaired chronotropic response, this can tell you whether the limitation may be more from the stroke volume or the cellular oxygen extraction as compared with um, being a limitation from their heart rate response. The oxygen uptake efficiency slope is the rate at which oxygen um, increases for a given minute of ventilation. Um, work efficiency, respiratory exchange ratio. The respiratory exchange ratio tells us about patient effort. Ventilatory threshold and ventilatory equivalent are also useful. Ventilatory equivalent can tell us about um, physiologic dead space in the lungs as well. So there's a lot of information that you can gather from it, but if we want to focus just on the peak VO2 for a moment, what can the peak VO2 tell us about patients with congenital heart disease in general? Well, if you have a patient with a Fontan heart in front of you and they have done a cardiopulmonary exercise test, you look at that max VO2 number and you're trying to figure out where does this, this patient compare with other Fontan patients, with other patients with other types of congenital heart disease, and with a normal patient as well with a normal um, heart. And so there are tables and charts like this that can help us understand where our patient lies in that spectrum. So that can be helpful. This is patient of Fontan patient who's doing well or one that's not doing so well compared with their colleagues. Again, looking at adult congenital heart disease as an entire cohort, we know that cardiopulmonary exercise testing can to give us information about um, their five-year mortality um, and the risk of adverse events. And so we know that the higher their max VO2, the less likely they are to have events in the next five years. But what specifically about the Fontan patient then? Um, and what about transplant, which we're gonna be talking about today? Does cardiopulmonary exercise testing help tell us when a patient needs to be referred for, for a transplant? There is this study that was published um, this year that looked at patients who were referred for a transplant with all different types of congenital heart disease. And you'll see here that the MVO2 for these patients um, ranges anywhere from a low of 12 up to a 20. And this contrasts with patients in a heart failure cardiomyopathy practice where we more consistently expect for patients to require transplant referral when that MVOT2 gets to 10 or 15. So this study would suggest that if we wait for patients to reach that standard MVO2 of 10 to 15 before referring for them transplant, we may be referring them fairly late. So the conclusion from this study was that cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a valuable tool, but isn't necessarily a gatekeeper that tells us when to refer patients for transplant. Well, what else can cardiopulmonary exercise tell, testing tell us about prognosis then in the Fontan patient specifically? There was this elegant study from Alex Egby at Mayo from a couple of years ago looking at cardiopulmonary exercise testing in Fontan patients specifically. And what he showed us is that when a Fontan patient has a decline in a peak VO2 of greater than 3% per year, that this is an ominous sign and it predicts um, a higher likelihood of having an adverse cardiac event compared with those who have more stable peak VO2s. So hopefully I've helped you um, review echocardiograms, how we use them in our practice here, what information that it gives us, um, and also talked about cardiopulmonary exercise testing, what information we get from that. And the other thing I would add is that we, Dr. Albelson will be going over cardiopulmonary exercise um, exercise testing in heart catheterizations as well, because more and more we want to try to understand how exercise impacts Fontan hemodynamics. So at some point, we'll probably be combining cardiopulmonary exercise testing and cardiac catheterization um, in our, many of our patients as well. Thank you very much for your attention.